Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to episode number 122. This is going to be a continuation of the Grokking Kubernetes series, and we're going to be exploring DNS, which is one of my favorite topics. There's always kinds of always always tons of fun to do with with uh, DNS. Just to kick it off right, I'll share this graphic, which is one of my favorite graphics related to the topic, and it is uh, it's not DNS. There's no way it's DNS. It was DNS. It's a DNS haiku, and I, I think you'll find that it's pretty relevant to the topic at hand. So, <clears throat> Anyway, good to see you all. I'm glad you're here. Let's see who signed in and checked in with us here. We got Rory saying hello from... You did it to me again, Rory. Lock oil head. Lock oil head. Rory also posted a, a really wonderful whiskey the other day, and I think I might just have to get some. And Chaco saying hello from Jakarta. And over to you saying hello from Zug, Switzerland. And Joy, checking in from Richmond, Virginia. Good to see you, Joy. And Liam from the UK, good to see you. Tim, checking in from Dublin. That's not too far from me. It's, it's close to a town which I'd, I've never understood the name of. It's called Pleasanton. And like Pleasanton, it's hot. So I don't know how that's pleasant to me. Mr. Jeremy Pruitt, checking in. Good to see you, sir. Yuvraj, that's from Mountains, India. That was neat. I didn't know there was an area called Mountains. I kind of like that, though. <coughs> yeah, I know. I was, you know, but you got to show the core OS love when you can, right? It's like we made, we made a lot of really good improvements on things. Subby saying hello from Istanbul. Good to see you too, Subby. And Grigor from Moldova. Martin from the Netherlands. Good to see you, Martin. And AJ from San Jose. Mr. Steve Sloka checking in. Good to see you, sir. Janek from Livermore. And Phil from the NYC. And Mike, one of my coworkers. Checking in, saying hello. We got Jasper from Tampa, Tampa, Florida. I don't know why I said Tampa, Florida. And Dylan from Williamsburg, Virginia. Peter from Kenya. <coughs> Jenrong from Sudbury, Ma Massachusetts. Morteza from Tehran. Roy from Toronto. And Alberto from Colombia. Awesome. Good to see you all. Great to, great to see you. Again, you know, it never ceases to... Never uh, ceases to surprise me how many people we have from all over the world checking in. So I hope you've all had a great week of being excellent to each other, and let's get into it here. We got Mona saying hello from Germany. All right. So this week, I've got some neat stuff for you. Uh, as always, our notes are up at tgik.io slash notes. And so if you'd like to uh, put something in there or if you just want to like follow a link or if you have a link to share with the rest of everybody, YouTube doesn't really let people share links inside the YouTube chat. Uh, I have to like somebody has to allow it or whatever. So if you do want to have a link that you want to share some other content, go ahead and put it in tgik.io slash notes. And that's where you'll find it here. Um, we use HackMD for this. It's an incredible service. All right, so this week in K8's core, 119 is still in beta two, no changes in the last two weeks, which is a good sign. Release team has lots of point releases stuff happening this week. Um, mostly having to do with Hypercube and Cube Proxy failures. Um, this is, You may remember that uh, there was a Cube Proxy thing where it was related to like what version or, or being able to detect the version of IP tables available on the underlying host. And I think this is all related to that. So if you're interested in understanding a little bit more about those point releases, you can check them out. But speaking of CoreOS love, uh, Hypercube is deprecated and it will not be patched or maintained going forward from 119. Uh, so if you're using Hypercube in your infrastructure, might be time to, um, to rethink the plan and like look at, look at some of the other tooling. Whoops. Oh, dang it. I just closed my HackMD notes. One second. Anybody remember the URL? TGIK.io live notes. There we go. But I got to spell notes right, you know, because that's how that works. There we go. All right. Also, I noticed in the, um, there's a great website called lwkd.info and it's hosted it's um, managed by a few of friends and um including josh burkus whose idea it was and who ha does it does an incredible job of me of maintaining some interesting notes about things that are happening in the space and what i noticed was that in 119 we're actually removing kubectl export 
from the kubectl command line. It's going away, and I'm kind of sad to see that go. It was really a super handy thing for me to, to use when like trying to take a manifest from an existing cluster and moving it to another one without having to actually go through and like remove a bunch of the boilerplate stuff uh, manually. Um, but that's but that's been deprecated now for a bit, and it's mostly part of the part of the move towards server side apply and that sort of stuff. Kind of changes the way those things are working. So, kubectl export will be gone in the newer versions of kubectl. Other exciting news from the Kubernetes eco from the Kubernetes ecosystem. Let me pull back on my chat here, make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, Harbor has graduated from the CNCF, so that's pretty exciting. Let's take a look at that one. So Harbor, which is a project <coughs> that was donated to the CNCF by VMware and some and, and some of our other folks, uh, just recently hit Harbor 2.0. And it's an incredible registry. If you're looking for a registry to uh, host your images locally or in your cloud environment, um, definitely check out Harbor. It's a thing that you can install and deploy directly on top of Kubernetes if you want to, or you can also deploy it as um, in a variety of other ways. So just recently graduated, that's super exciting. If you're interested in playing with Harbor, definitely check it out. I know that we've done a few um, episodes on Harbor as well, so definitely check that out. What else? Dex, which is another project I worked on at CoreOS, um, is now a CNCF sand project, sandbox project. It just got accepted into the CNCF and it's now being onboarded. So that's exciting news. Dex, if you're unfamiliar, is it acts as kind of like a middleware between um, uh, your source of uh, user authentication. It could be LDAP or OIDC or, or um, a variety of other technologies um, and Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes itself only speaks, um, can only interact with, let's just pull this up real quick. My brain is like not really with me 100% today. So let's see, Kube API server. So, in the Kube BI server command lines, flags, we have the ability to present, I think it's an OADC provider, but I want to make, I want, I don't want to get it wrong, so let's just make sure we look at it real quick and see for sure. Yes. So, in the API server flag, you can actually pop populate these strings. Um, which are the configuration flags for an OIDC provider, right? And so if, if you had DEX installed inside your cluster or you know anywhere local to your infrastructure, then you could populate this with information that would point toward DEX. And then DEX, DEX would act as the middleware for those sources of information that you want to use uh, or do you want to refer to for authentication. And so the benefit of that would be like if you had an LDAP um, like, you know, an internal LDAP or Active Directory or something inside of your corporation and you wanted to be able to reference users from that directory, uh, um, DEX can actually can act like the glue in between there, right? And so the call would come in to authenticate to DEX. You would pass your credential to that. It would challenge the credential against um, LDAP or whatever it is you have configured as a backend. Once that you passed that, once DEX uh, was, was satisfied in your authentication to that store, then what you get back is a token, an OIDC token or JWT token that uh, the API server can use to authenticate you into Kubernetes. Now this is just authentication. This is auth Z, not auth N. So this is auth N, not auth Z. So this would handle the ability to actually teach Kubernetes about users that are stored inside of Active Directory or OIDC or, or other stores of information, but it won't uh, handle things like uh, putting you, uh, uh, granting you access to stuff. It just grants you, it just authenticates you. So interesting tooling. But it's great to see that gets donated to the CNCF because um, it means that like the project's moving forward and we'd like to see some more adoption. I know that we could probably use a few more contributors on it. So if you're interested in, in uh, this space, definitely check it out. If you want to check it out, it's at Dex IDP. It's the github.com. If you want to check this out, you can check it out here. My friend Steven is one of the maintainers now. There's lots of good stuff happening and it, it, it does a pretty good job of documenting itself. So definitely check that out. This was the authentication tool that we built for Tectonic back in the day. 
Another interesting project that just popped up, a friend of mine was telling me about it. Oh, thank you very much, whoever that is. Um, well, pointed it out, and I think this is actually kind of an interesting project. It's written by John Reese, <coughs> um, or who, who seems to be working on it pretty directly. Um, and this project's called Constraint, and I think it could be another interesting episode to catch. Uh, it's pretty early in its life cycle, so I haven't committed to doing an episode on it. Um, but it looks pretty interesting. So this tool basically exists so that you can, to provide, a, uh, to provide tooling to allow you to generate constraint templates that you could use not only for something like the OPA project, but also for things like CompTest. And that actually, I think, is probably one of the more interesting uh, implementations for that sort of thing, right? The killer part of that would be if you if you went down that path, you'd be able to actually use CompTest to validate the configuration of things before um, uh, assuming that they would work when those things got inserted into your cluster, right? So if you wrote a constraint template that said no pods can use a uh, um, can run without having some resource uh, definition, right? Like you have to at least provide some resource definition before the pod will be allowed into the cluster. Then in this model, you could say, well, before I apply those resources to my cluster, I could use conf test locally to validate that those, that that policy would apply correct cleanly. And if, and if it didn't catch it in CI before it ever gets tried, before it ever gets deployed into a cluster. And you can, you can further take that same policy and apply it as an admission controller using OPA, allowing you to say, like, even those things that don't come through that channel, right, through CompTest or that CI, you can enforce the same policy inside a, as an admission controller. And so I like that, I like that belt and suspenders approach, you know, I like the, I like the idea of being able to actually validate both uh, in flight using an admission controller and also uh, in practice using like perhaps a step in your CI CD flow. I think that's a pretty killer, pretty killer functionality. So if you're interested in playing with this, definitely check it out. I think John was looking for some in, uh, some people to try it out and see what they think. Uh, he's when I chatted with him earlier, he said it was ready for use to play with and see what people think. Um, but yeah, check it out. Pretty cool stuff. Coming on back to the chat now. Let's see how we're doing. We got Bochan Bochanch from saying hello. We got Moe saying hello, good to see you. And Sebastian from Hungary, and Juka from Helsinki. Emrin, or Emrikan from Turkey, good to see you. Peter, what's up? Good to see you, Peter. Alex Barnes, good to see you. <coughs> we got Philippe from Paris, and we got Lamadi, good to see you, Lamadi. Oh, wow. Lamadi attended the Atlanta meetup, the Atlanta Kubernetes meetup. That one did look pretty good. It was, in a, it was a virtual one, if I remember correctly. And that's a good question, Alex. You should stay on him for that. Lamati would be great to have present there. Daniel <coughs> from Warsaw, good to see you, Daniel. And Marcin from Krakow, Poland, and Robson from Fortaleza, Brazil. Wow. And Moe's saying Kubernetes, Kubernetes 118 support dash dash dry run server. Do, you, do we still need a project like Constraint? I believe that we do. Because um, really this is about evaluating uh, resources um, before applying those resources, right? Providing some ability to define uh, define business policy that may be beyond um, beyond things that we can do with like pod security policies and those sorts of things, and being able to enforce those policies both in flight using an admission controller and also in, before applying those resources like inside of CI/CD as a test. So I do think that I do think it's still important. Pedro saying hello from Scotland. Good to see you, Pedro. And Jeremy saying, hey there, assuming you're not out because of the nice fog here. Actually, I'm just inside because, you know, it's, I, I like it inside my house as well as outside. But I should get back out in the garden. Maybe next week I'll do it from the garden. It's a good point. All right. I'll definitely check out Constraint. This next piece is the folks at Flant have an article. Nope, nope. The folks at Learn Kates have put up a uh, visualization on how to quarantine a pod in Kubernetes. And so if you've ever wondered about how that works, it gets into um, some of the pieces that are necessary. It doesn't quite get all of it, but I think it does a good job, right? So if your goal is to take a pod out of service, right? So that it's no longer receiving traffic and it's no longer a part of the deployment 
object itself. So the, the deployment would see, oh, I have to address it and make a new one. This is, this is how you could do that, right? You've got this pod, it's malfunctioning, and you want to move it out of the service. Uh, one way to do that is just handle that label, that label change, right? If you change the labels that are being used both for the service match and also for the, um, the match inside of the deployment, then what happens is you've kind of isolated that pod. It's no longer in the traffic path, and it's also no longer a part of the deployment object. Once you've changed that name, it basically becomes isolated. And now your other, now the deployment object will realize that there are only two remaining and it will set up to create a third one or a fourth one in this case. Now, what's interesting is the owner references are still there, right? So when it came time to delete, you would still see pod one go away. Um, but yeah, cool stuff. So definitely, if you're interested in understanding how that works, definitely check that out. Oh, this is from you, Daniel. I didn't realize that. Oh, that's awesome. <coughs> Daniel and Peter. I dig it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, all right. We also have config maps in Kubernetes and how they work and what you should remember. It's a good, decent article about config maps. <clears throat> a little background from rsync to Kubernetes. Talking about why config maps are a thing. Talking about 12 factor. Talking about the history, like where, where we came from with it. So basic config maps, like the content, how you actually describe the content for these things and how they can be interpolated, which is pretty cool. What if there are multiple configs? This goes into some pretty good detail. Yeah, it's a good article. Definitely pretty cool. Yeah, if you're interested in understanding how to provide configuration to things within your cluster, and if you haven't already explored this, I think this would be a great entry point for people understanding how config maps work and some of the concerns with them, because they definitely call out some of the challenges. Like if you're going to use a config map, it basically places that file or environment variables inside of the runtime of your container. But if you wanna change those things uh, dynamically, how do you change them, right? If you change the config map, your environment isn't going to dynamically get updated. If you change a config map, the file that is based on that config map can be dynamically updated, but that doesn't mean that your application is watching for that dynamic update. Um, and so these are just a few of the things that you might concern yourself with when considering how config maps work. So it's a great, it's a great entry point for config maps inside of Kubernetes. My buddy Alex Ellis wrote an article about troubleshooting apps for Kubernetes. Um, <clears throat> and it's always a good thing to revisit. I think we're, I think a lot of folks are pretty decent at it, but I think that there's definitely, um, it's always good to kind of get back to basics for those sorts of things, right? So we have kubectl get events, which are a great way to actually understand what the system, is, what Kubernetes as a system itself is doing. We have kubectl describe, which is really an important one. Kubectl describe is neat because it tries to give you like a human consumable output of the configuration of the object. And it also appends down at the bottom of that object the events that are related to it, right? So you're kind of getting both. And then you have logs. And, oh, Alex, I'm surprised. Okay, but there's also uh, logs-p, which means logs previous. So there's two things. kubectl get logs, or kubectl logs on an object will allow you to see the logs for the current object. But if you're having a problem where like it, the last one died, and I wanna know what the logs for that last one was, were, you can do kubectl logs dash p for previous, and it will show you the previous logs. Pretty cool stuff. You can scale things up and down, you can port forward, all kinds of cool stuff. So yeah, I mean, definitely good troubleshooting steps. In the weird science category. <laughs> this one actually reminds me of another one I've seen, um, which was actually a, an implementation of Docker in Bash that was called Bakker. So when I saw this, I thought of that one. But this is actually pretty cool. This is a an implementation of Docker written in Go, right? And so if this is the sort of, uh, you know, neat science stuff that's interesting to you, definitely check it out, right? Like this is an implementation of all of the pieces it takes 
to create a container uh, inside of Go. Pretty cool. I dig that a lot. I mean, that's, a, that's such a neat idea. And they get into like what the pieces are, how they work, what namespaces are. They get into like uh, layered file systems and how the images and stuff work. Um, but yeah, like if, you're, if you've ever wondered a little bit more, you wanna learn a little bit more about the underlying uh, implementation of containers, this would probably be a killer article to dig into that stuff. Using unshare, throwing stuff into namespaces, how Gawker creates containers. Yep. I like how well it's documented too. Like you can really see what's happening, right? Like create the network namespace, set up the VS. jump into the namespace, the file system namespace. Very, very cool. So if you're interested in understanding kind of the underlying implementation a bit more, uh, definitely check that out. That's pretty cool. Alex saying hello from Northern California. Hello back from Northern California. Good to see you. Roy, Roy saying plus one for K-Rail. Do you mean K-Rail or Kale? Oh, Kale. Uh, K is it K-Tail? Yeah. One way or the other. I think I know what you're talking about. There's so many projects, but I know what you mean. Mr. Waleed saying hello. Good to see you, Waleed. And Bogdan mentioning Kale and AJ. Event Router is a good one. Yeah. Event Router was basically a tool to take events and throw them toward a logging solution. Exactly. Yeah. I think, did you work on that, Steve? I think Steve might have worked on that. Roy Resheft, Ops Genie, Kubernetes Event Exporter is another one. Yeah, we talked a little bit about events, some of the churn that events represent inside of the Kubernetes uh, distributed system in the etcd episode. So if you're interested in that, check that out. All right. In the other weird science category, I saw this article and I have to admit I was a little snarky perhaps on, uh, on Twitter, but that's what Twitter's for, right? And in this article it says, Bayer Crop Science seeds the future with 15,000 node GKE clusters. And on the one hand, I'm like, wow, that is an amazing, amazing piece of work. And on the other hand, I'm like, but why? Because if you, it, it, is, it is sort of like, this is sort of like taking a piece of software that's designed for one thing and just scaling it to infinity and seeing what happens or what falls off, right? And, and like trying to optimize as you go rather than considering the design of that in, in the beginning of it, right? Um, with any piece of software that you're going to deploy or manage or, or productionize or, or you know, put any trust in, you should you, you should evaluate it and understand what it's capable of and what and, and like you know what the what the design considerations were when it was created, so that you can dig into how to make sure that it is in line with reality for what you want to accomplish. Fifteen thousand nodes are very large clusters, for and in, in my opinion, for tons of reasons. This is like a crazy anti-pattern, right? Like one of those reasons might be, this is one huge failure domain, right? You have one control plane for 15,000 nodes. That's nuts. Like what happens if the control plane goes away? Now, fundamentally, like for 15,000 nodes, um, the kubelet will, is pretty autonomous. It's gonna keep things going while the control plane's gone. But at the same time, like a lot of that stuff is tunable. Like it's crazy. I think you're right. Events are the most underrated concept in Kubernetes. So I saw this and I was like, I, you know, I understand Kubernetes well enough at this point that I understand the scope of work necessary to accomplish this. And at the same time, I'm like, but you need to kind of have a real conversation about like why we're building 15,000 node clusters, because there's probably a better strategy here in my opinion, but I'd love to understand the use case. That's just my point. Anyway, Enough of that. Now we're back to, it's not DNS. There's no way it's DNS. It was DNS. So let's get into our checklist. We have a lot to cover this time. And so I wanted to kind of get into it uh, pretty early on and see what we, can, we, see what we can get done in about an hour, hour and a half. All right, so what's DNS? DNS is...
DNS is this, right? There's going to be IP addresses for things um, that we actually, or network addresses that we use to, um, to host, you know, to host services and stuff. And nobody wants to remember something like 2607F8BO4005808 colon colon 200E, right? Um, they really don't want to remember that. That's an IPv6 address. Uh, but they probably also don't want to remember a bunch of IPv IPv4 addresses. And so we created this abstraction, the domain name system, right? DNS gives us the ability to give a thing a short name. Rather than having it have a, a super long name, we can use a short name for that thing. And that way we can look those things up and we can, re and we can reference them. Now, like all abstractions, there are problems, right? Uh, DNS is one of the first distributed systems that I ever worked with. And I call it a distributed system because if you look at how it works underneath the covers, um, there are usually a number of domain name servers and, and places where caching works across that whole system before you actually get your result. So when I do host google.com, if I actually, let's just break that up a little bit. If I cat etsy resolve.com, I can see that my configuration is pointing at localhost 127.0.0.53 and I'm on my AT&T fiber here and that's my DNS resolver. Now, you might think, well, that's weird. How could he be resolving host names against localhost? And that's because I actually have a caching DNS res resolver on my system installed on my laptop. And this means that I don't have to go and look up every re every result. I can actually determine. I can result. I can hit that cache and get a cached result of any host name that I look up. So if I do host google.com again, this result is cached. I don't actually have to go out and look it up again. I can base it on the on the cache. But if I instead had a name server of 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 or perhaps my uh, ISP's DNS server that um, comes comes to me from the ISP, let's see, let's see, run systemd. We'll just look at that real quick. Leases. There we go. So these are the name servers that I have configured for my overall system, right? I've configured myself to use 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 and 8.8.4.4. .8 so if I make it past the cache, these are my upstream resolvers. So when I make a query for hostgoogle.com, the request goes to a cache, that local 127.0.0.1 systemd resolved d daemon, and it says, I have an answer for that, and it provides it to me. But if it doesn't have an answer for that, then it goes and asks these guys up here for an answer to that same question. <clears throat> and on up the stack it goes, right? If Google doesn't know the answer, then it needs to go and figure out who the authoritative domain name server for that question is, and then goes and queries that upstream resolver for that particular piece. So we can actually even take a look at that real quick and just like understand how that's gonna work. So let's do, uh, mm, test.metal.com. <clears throat> okay, so test.metal.k8.work has the address 1.1.1.1. But how did it determine what the IP address associated with that record is, right? That's not going to be determined. That's not known by my local cache, per se. Uh, so there's actually a whole series of questions, a whole series of queries that happen when we try and determine how, what the answer to this is. So if we do dig, um, test.metal.k8.work, we can see the result of this particular query. And the record, the full, the fully qualified record, right, is, uh, tells me that there's an entry for this particular record that points to this IP address. 
and that that record would be valid for right around 300 more seconds. But maybe I want to know who the authoritative name servers are for that whole domain, right? For the domain metal.kh.org. Who would I go ask to see um, what the IP address for that particular record are, or, or, for, or what, for the IP address for what that particular record is, right? And so one of the other queries I can use dig to determine is I can say, tell me the name servers for a particular domain. And then knowing the name servers, I can actually query them again if I want, right? So if I do dig test.metal.k8.work and I put an at symbol in and paste this in, then I get the same result that I got oops, before and this time, I actually get um, I get the same result that I got before, but I get the query I've, I've queried that particular server directly, right? This is actually how I can query a specific a specific name server or even authoritative name server directly for the result of an answer. So that's a pretty kind of hot, oh that didn't actually work, did it? It sent me to which must be the IPv6 address for that. That's cool. So, um, so this is so this is a way to understand like kind of just how functionally from a high level how DNS works. There are a, vari a variety of different answers, um, a var variety of different records that we create inside of DNS. But the important ones for this particular episode are going to be things like NS. NS records, which represent like the authoritative server or how we actually understand the host or the information for a particular record. Um, another thing we're gonna, we're gonna use is A records, which describe a mapping between a host name and an IP address or a set of IP addresses. And then the last one we're gonna use is a C name record. And I don't think I have an example of that one right now, but we're gonna get into it. Um, and the C name record stands for canonical name and what that does is it actually allows us to kind of just map one host name to another. Rather than having to map back to an IP address, we can actually just say test.metal.kh.work. Whenever somebody queries me for that, I want you to respond as though they had queried for this other name, a canonical name. And we'll, and we'll dig into that a bit as well. Oh, interesting. DNS.squish.net. I haven't seen that one. Let's, play. Let's go check that one out. The DNS or dig? I am not a bot. Oh boy, training computers is my life. All right. Test.metal.kh.work. That's pretty neat. So this is basically traversing a bunch of different name servers and understanding the result. So all of the authoritative name servers all respond with the same output. That's a bonus. And it means that, you know, things that are actually trying to find a record for that will be able to consistently get the answer across the whole set. That's pretty neat. So we went to the root servers, that sent us here. Then we went to AWS and we started getting responses. Here's the result of cached, cached results, right? We got these cached ca cache resolves. That's pretty slick. Kind of dig how that's been done. So a good way of actually understanding how uh, resolution stuff works, right? So our host name directly was test.metal.kh.work. Then we had to figure out who the authoritative entry point for that was. That sent us all the way back to the TLD, which was the work TLD. And then we went up to my my uh, domain on the work TLD, kh.work. And then we went to the subdomain, metal.kh.work. And then we went to, and then we resolved um, the host. And that was actually how 
That's why you see so many branches here, because we're several layers down. All right. Yes, you're right. C name is totally the sim link of DNS. So, you know, at a high level, um, that's what DNS is going to do for us and sort of a kind of a high level view of some of the tooling that we can use to kind of understand things and how those things work. Now, I want to go back to my checklist. <clears throat> so that's, in my opinion, that's probably enough of what is DNS to understand what it is. Now we're going to talk about like how it's used and some of the challenges in the way that it's used. So let's play with that. All right, so docker run it bash bash. So when I create a container um, by default, uh, running running on Linux, then I get an Etsy resolve.com file. And we can see that my resolve.com file looks very different than it does on the underlying host. And this is an implementation detail of Kubernetes uh, of Docker itself, right? Docker realized that my name server was 127001 and that I had a local cached systemd proce process handling that stuff. And it was like, yeah, but if I, if I point you at localhost, then that'll be the localhost inside the container with you and nothing will resolve. And so instead, I'm going to modify your resolve.conf such that you actually get working resolvers. And we're going to do that by pointing at the, diff the, the one that was before the modification. And that way, the benefit here is that we get working resolvers, right? I can do host google.com, or I can do apk add, uh, is it the DNS utils or bind utils? Bind tools. Ah. Okay, so we can do dig test.metal.case.work, just like we did before. And we get a result. We do host google.com, we get results. Those things all work for us. Now, if you're inside of a container, uh, inside of an operating system that doesn't already have these tools like bind and, and dig, or sorry, uh, dig and host and those sorts of things, usually they're part of a package of uh, software that can be referred to as like bind tools or bind utils. And that's what I had to install here. Now, another interesting thing, I'm on, um, Right now I'm running this on top of an Alpine container. And then that's why when I did APK update, right, I'm actually interacting with APK uh, Alpine Linux. Alpine Linux doesn't use uh, glibc at, um, as its um, C library. It uses muscle, which is an alternative C library. And as part of that alternative, it actually uh, implements the uh, host lookup stuff very differently, which is kind of interesting. And so if we do nslookup, uh, google.com, actually, I think they've stopped complaining about it. But for a while, when you did nslookup for a thing, it would actually complain um, that something was not resolvable. I think it's, fi it's finally been addressed. But it was a problem for a bit. Um, one of the other things that's interesting about the muscle implementation is that the way that it config the way that it conforms to resolving things is a bit different um, in that Alpine Linux will basically make a query every single time for every record. Um, whereas like glibc and stuff will actually cache some of those things and it won't it, and, it, and it will handle these things in kind of a serial fashion. Um, so if you're interested in understanding a little bit more about how muscle does its thing versus how um, glibc does its thing, definitely check this stuff out. But they call out a couple of different really good, or really good and salient points, right? Mm -hmm. Having a caching name server is a great way to reduce the number of DNS queries that hit the wire. Um, having a DNS server that is um, local to your account, right? Like if you're actually using uh, an ISP or or one that's local inside of your data center, is always going to be kind of lower latency. Um, and if it's caching, even better. Maybe like a bigger cache. Uh, then it can actually handle offloading those DNS queries. But if you're going out somewhere super far away to cache those things, it means that you're going like to 8.8.8.8, for example, then it means you're going to have a little bit higher latency, but you're also going to have the likelihood that your query isn't going to get further than 8.8.8.8. So that's 
So these things all kind of factor into like how we think about these things. But it is good to know, and it is actually a really interesting point because it's come up a few times, like how does uh, how does an Alpine Linux container handle uh, and uh, lookup versus how does glibc or you know some of the more standard um, libc libraries handle those sorts of things? They do handle them differently, um, and mostly the the real salient the salient difference is you get more queries on the wire when you use uh, muscle than you do when you use glibc because of the way the, the, the way it serialized the requests and what it does in the meantime, effectively. So check those out. Good Kubernetes stuff. Other stuff that happens on the host, which is interesting. So we got, I wanna take a look at these real quick inside of our Docker container. So we've already talked about etsyresolve.conf. etsyresolve.conf does a few different things. Uh, it has a search path, so if I actually had a host name that um, a, a short name for something, and I did host, you know, foo.attlocal.net. No, I don't have one. Let's see, ns1. Let's see if there's ns1.attlocal.net. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Let's do. This. Let's do this. Time, because it's actually more relevant here anyway. Create. Cluster. Alpine does respect the TTL, yes. It's just that when it's actually, um, and the TTL, let's talk about what the TTL is real quick. Very good point. The TTL is basically the, the time to live for a record, right? And so when we did dig, uh, test.metal.kh.work, we saw this value here. This is the number. It tells us the TTL or time to live for this record. At the end of this expiration, then whoever's caching this particular result will have to go up and validate against its next upstream a result again and get back a TTL. So now we're back at 299, 297, 295, and it'll be this way cached locally for me for 293 more seconds, and then we'll actually um, query it again. The benefit of configuring that TTL is it allows you to turn, it allows you to define how long the mapping between that IP address and that host name will last globally, everywhere, uh, as a, as an as a as a max amount of time. So when you when you when I create this record inside of uh, AWS Route 53 or whatever or anywhere else. Um, then I, and I specify a TTL of 300 seconds, but I'm saying nowhere in the world should somebody assume that test.metal.kh.work is going to point to the same IP address for more than 300 seconds. It can assume that I won't move it for 300 seconds, and then any further than that, it has to recheck with me and let me know if, um, if that's changed. And you're right, 300 seconds is pretty short-lived. But yeah, my DNS servers are pretty aggressive that way. Alrighty. What's interesting about this though, and, I, and this is actually kind of an interesting point that I've I've struggled with a few times to actually uh, explain. Right? If I do, if I do uh, say dig test.metal, okay, it's not work. I have, um, 200 seconds remaining on that record. If I do docker exec ti or run it rm bash bash. Let's just check this out real quick. It's kind of neat. So now we have two different network namespaces, two different ways of resolving hosts, effectively two different implementations of the DNS uh, library. So up here inside the container, if we do apk add bind tools, and then we do dig test.metal.kh.work, and down here we do dig test.metal.kh.work, you can see I have 147 seconds, and up here we have 299. And so what I wanted to point out here is that 
what we're looking at is that TTL is locally relevant. It's not a global value that everybody tracks. What's getting what we're getting back that is actually the thing that everybody tracks is the TTL value. It's 300 seconds. So when you as a DNS server or inside of your Linux or inside of your kernel, when you get when you resolve that name, you're going to honor that name for that many seconds. That's it. Not more than that. Only those 300 seconds. Right? <clears throat> but what I was trying to point out here was that these values would be different. Even though we're still talking about the same Linux kernel, we're still talking about all of that stuff. The way that um, get host by name lookup happens in both of these two places is different. There are two different network namespaces, two different sets of libraries. One of them has a caching name server, the other one doesn't, right? And so in my, in my interaction with this particular server, I'm seeing 300 seconds. In my interaction with my local with my local name with my local caching name server, I have 147 seconds. So let me uh, take care of some stuff here real quick. All right. So cool. What else do we have happening in the chat? It is system D resolved D. You're right. So even if you don't run Chrome, they'll track you, nice debugging tool. Yeah. Happy Friday, y'all. Plus trace, TTL 300 seconds, also true. All right. Yeah, 60 is pretty high. Okay. It is honored by the DNS uh, server, you're right. When I said your kernel, I guess I meant, I was referring to like whatever it is that you're using to resolve DNS. And this one here, in, in, in the underlying host, I'm using this systemd resolver. Um, but inside the container, I'm using 8.8.8.8. .8 and I believe that the way they implement that is session-based. Because if I do a refresh, right, it's, it's actually, it's any cast, that's right. So if I do a refresh, as, as I bounce through the different backends, we can see the, um, the TTL changes in ways that don't make a ton of sense, right? Because we're actually hitting a different resolver each time. And some of those resolvers are 129 seconds in. Some of those resolvers are 273 seconds in. You can kind of see how that's working. Whereas like my local cache, I'm not gonna see that change. I'm gonna see it change one per second, right? And that's because the thing that's actually caching that resolution is systemd resolve D. So good point, Bogdan. All right. Moving on here. Other things that are to know about the host. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. How does your system resolve uh, these things? Like what, what, what configuration do you have on the host that allows you to modify the way these things are resolved, right? So we already talked about um, cat etsy resolve.com. Actually, I'm gonna jump into my kind, uh, say cube kettle. Run it rm bash bash So now we're on the same bash container, but we're inside a Kubernetes cluster. And we do a cat etsy resolve.conf and we can see that our resolver is different. It's no longer the resolver that I had on my underlying host, it's the resolver that points to a service IP address the 1096010. Mm -hmm. So whatever your service CIDR is for your cluster, it's always going to it's usually always going to be .10 um, inside the cluster. But we see a few other things that are interesting about this resolve.conf that are different than the one that I had on my local one, right? Like in my local one I had a search line, I had a couple of different name servers. Um, inside the cluster what I see is I have one name server. It's pointed at a service that can be backed by multiple things. Um, I have this thing called options and dot five and dots five and we'll talk about that in here in just a bit. But I also but look at my search line. Search line is also different, right? My search line includes default.service.cluster.local, service cluster.local, 
and cluster.local, and then also whatever my upstream search, uh, search line was. All right. So let's do a couple things like we did before. So let's do apk install bind tools. Oh, add. And then we'll do dig test.metal.kh.work. And we can see that there are 30 seconds remaining. <laughs> we can see 1.1.1.1. And we can see that there are multiple DNS servers, just like we saw before. What do you think will happen when I hit the end of nine more seconds? Do you think it'll go back to 500 or 300? Sorry. No, it goes back to 30. So in this case, Core DNS is configured to be more aggressive than the record itself is. So Core DNS is caching, and it's only ever caching for 30 seconds. So dig google.com, same thing, right? 30 seconds. So one of the other things that's happening here, which I think is really interesting, is that we're also seeing a problem that will come up when we think about the way that DNS works inside of distributed systems, right? One of the questions that people ask me sometimes is, can I use a host name inside of a network policy object, right? Can I say I want to allow a pod access to a particular URL rather than, uh, or to a particular host name, rather than I want to allow access to a, from a pod to a specific IP address, right? The reason I'm calling this out is because if we look at the result here, we can see that google.com is resolving to at least two different IP addresses, although it's not doing it anymore. Um, but in the previous records, we saw 216, and we also saw 172.217.046. So when we're looking up these records, that's actually two different IP addresses that could be google.com, right? Which is pretty interesting. That means that google.com has two valid IP addresses. And this is gonna be true of tons of stuff. It's not just google.com. Because it has multiple A records, we can, we're, just ran, we're, we're randomly gonna be handed one of them as a result. And that means, and that's the thing you have to consider when you're thinking about how to, um, a thing you have to consider when you're thinking about like whether it's possible or whether it's a, even a reasonable design to implement a thing that would allow you to define network policy based on hosting. Somebody still has to resolve that. And hopefully that someone is still is, is the entity that is going to forward your request to whatever the IP address that was resolved. And so you have to be, you have to kind of consider that stuff. All right. Now, other stuff that's happening inside of resolve.conf, right? We have these search fields. And the reason these search fields exist is they allow us to look things up by short name, right? So if we do, uh, let's see, uh, host Kubernetes, we can see I just typed in Kubernetes and I resolved to host.default.service.cluster.local and it gave me an IP address that resolved to it. So even though I've only just sped, I only, I only said Kubernetes, I was able to determine that there is actually a thing called Kubernetes. It just has a whole bunch of other things after that name. I was able to resolve that and, and determine an IP address for that record. But how does that work? Right? What are some of the things that we can use to configure that? So inside of that resolve.conf, when we looked at the search path, basically we're configuring the resolver, the local resolver, whether it's muscle or glibc, to query whatever this record is against each of these results. And the difference between glibc and muscle is that muscle like hits all of them and tries to determine one. 
And glibc will take this one and see if it resolves, and then check this one and see if it resolves, and then check this one and see if it resolves, and then check this one and see if it resolves. Right? <coughs> and so, like the the, um, the volume of DNS traffic resu uh, result resulted from that is very different. This is actually especially true if you start start thinking about like dual stack scenarios where you have IPv4 and IPv6 working DNS. Like, which way do we go? Do we have to resolve on each? <coughs> so that's what that search path is doing is it's allowing us to resolve those host names by basically making it so that if we provide a name, host Fred dot, we can see that Fred doesn't re re return anything. There's no Fred anywhere in these. There's no Fred dot, Default.service.cluster.local. There's no fred.service.cluster.local, nor, nor is there in just inside of the cluster.local domain or at ATT.local. Now, before we move off of this topic, I want to talk about this particular search path in particular, right? This one here says default.service.cluster.local. And this is happening because um, the pod that I deployed is in the default uh, namespace, right? And so by default, some of the magic of service discovery is anything with a host name or any other, uh, any service defined in the same namespace that you are also located in, you can address by name. So let's play with that idea real quick and just kind of show you what I'm talking about. So I'll do kubectl run it, actually run create deployment. Dash and echo. Actually, we'll call it echo. Image will be inanimate echo server. Cube get all expose deployment echo port equals a. Now what I did there was I just used the kubectl create command to make a new deployment for this particular echo server and I added a and I exposed it using a service and by default it'll expose it using a service of type um, cluster IP. So let's do our kubectl describe svc echo. We can see that it's there. We can see that it's type cluster IP. This is the service IP address. There's one healthy endpoint, and that's IP, and the IP address of that endpoint is 10.244.0.6. Pretty standard, bog standard deployment and service, right? So let's jump back into our bash command. I'm doing something. Viva. <coughs> All right. So again, we have our resolve.conf, just like we expect. If we do environment, we can see that there is an echo service defined inside my environment, right? Echo port and echo service, those things exist. If I do di uh, host echo, then it will resolve to the cluster IP associated with that service. So if I have two deployments in the same thing and I'm just trying to reference both services within the same namespace, I can just use that short name to get there. And that's fundamentally how it works, right? It's going to, if we're using glibc to look things up, glibc is going to honor the the, um, the search path inside of etsyresolve.com. And it's going to try, see if it can find a record for us. That's true. Okay. Now, uh, the other piece of this is, this is something that tripped me up quite a few times. If I do dig echo, what do you think will happen? I mean, some of you already know, I know it. But what do you think will happen? It doesn't return anything. Right? I don't get a record. Why not? Does anybody know? Because by default, is it plus search? Yeah. By default, dig doesn't honor the search path. Dig expects you to have actually 
figured that out ahead of time. Like you're gonna, it's expecting you to give it a fully qualified name. Exactly. Rory has been bitten by this one himself. I myself have been bitten by this. I'm like, I know that I have the record because I can do host, right? Host works. How come dig doesn't work? It's because dig by default doesn't actually uh, use your search path at all. But if you wanted to turn that on, then you can just specify that by doing plus search and it will give you the response. So interesting challenge. All right. Other things I wanted to show you about, uh, about DNS. Host is better than that word. That's true, yeah. It's actually a little closer to how the your application would use it too, right? Because a host is just gonna use glibc implementation. Oh, okay. Now let's just quickly talk about NSS switch and guy.com. These are two things which I think I don't wanna miss. So let's just talk about them. So you talked about how search pathware, we talked about etsyresolve.com. There are two other super important files, actually three other super important files, but let's take them in order. That's right. Um, <laughs> fun stuff. Ubuntu. Bash. Not every um, container actually has this. But this file, uh, nsswitch.com, basically, or nsswitch.conf, se-nsswitch.conf, informs the system in what order to look things up, right? So when I go looking up a host name, in this configuration, it will go and search files first, and we'll talk about what files means here in a second, and then it will search the DNS records, right? So when I do host bash, uh, apt install find use, Unfortunately, we have pretty good internet here, so. Just takes a second here. Really? Okay. Host. All right. So host bash. Let's see. Hosts. <coughs> so what? After all of that, sorry about that. That's kind of a, uh, uh, a bit of a maze. So inside of our NSS switch, we have a, a thing that says if we're looking up a host or a host name, we want to resolve to files first and then to DNS. And so software inside of this container, if I were to do host uh, bash, it doesn't seem to be honoring. second here. I'm missing something obvious. There we go. All right. So that's what I was trying to get to. For some reason, host isn't actually honoring the NSS switch, but applications like ping would, right? So curl and ping and applications that were actually honor those sorts of things, they're going to they're gonna honor the NSS switch. And if we were to use strace or something, we could actually even see it hitting that call, right? So in this case, we see the result of um, bash being resolving to an IP address. 
And if we do ping bash, if we do ping echo, right? There's no echo res resolved here. Or sorry, echo resolves to a service IP. Echo resolved using our search path, just like we talked about before, to echo.default.service.cluster.local. And it resolved to this cluster IP. And it's not pingable because it's a service. But, oh yeah, DNS. So that's what we're working on. Okay, so because of Etsy NSS switch, whenever an application that honors glibc uh, is doing a lookup for a host name, it's going to look for files first, so Etsy hosts, and then it's going to look for DNS, so that's going to be your resolve.conf. And it's going to take it in that order. If you have a local file defined, or if you have your uh, host name defined in side of um, Etsy hosts, then that's going to take precedent over what's inside of DNS, right? So if I do host google.com, I can see that it's resolving to all of that stuff. And if I do echo or cat Etsy hosts, echo, right? So I've just added a new record for google.com. Now if I do uh, ping google.com, it's resolving to 1.1.1.1, right? Even though that's not the authoritative record, I've configured in NSS switch, I want you to trust the file before you trust the DNS server. This, this is kind of an interesting thing, especially from a security perspective. Things get kind of interesting there when you could get away with stuff like that. All right, there's one other file inside of a glibc system that's important, and that is this one. GAI.conf, and this one is a hard, le hard learned lesson that I've learned quite a few times, uh, quite a few times in my career, but I'm going to share it with you, so you, maybe you can just learn it from me, which would be awesome. So GAI stands for Get Address Info or Get Adder Info, and it configures the way, the ordering of of the way that um, uh, results are evaluated when you do a lookup. Exactly. So in this, in this file, by default, the precedence is outlined here. By default, the precedence, <coughs> uh, as you can see like here, right? It's, gonna, it's, going to take, it's going to honor those things that are local and it's gonna honor um, global, IP um, global IP6 addresses. All of these things are higher in precedence than IPv4. And that means that when I look up, uh, when I do a, uh, a lookup of a host name, if there is a valid IPv6 result, I'm going to return that IPv6 address as the result before I return an IPv4 address as a result. And so depending on what you're working on, uh, depending on how your uh, environment may be set up, like for a while I worked on some infrastructure where uh, the DNS server would be able to actually resolve IPv6, but routing IPv6 into the infrastructure that I was working on was not a thing. So even though I could resolve the IPv6 address, I couldn't reach it. And so that was breaking DNS for the world. And so I ended up using guy.conf to basically fix that uh, temporarily, basically setting the precedence of IPv6 lower so that I would always resolve IPv4 first. And then uh, the problem went away until we were able to actually resolve the problem with IPv6. But guy.conf and sswitch.conf. We hit those two things. That's what I wanted to show you. So if you were going to, if you wanted to prefer IPv4 connections, then you can change the precedence for IPv6 to be uh, uh, prioritized up to about 100. And that means that you'll always try IPv4 first. And if there is no IPv4 uh, result, then you'll, then you'll re respond with the IPv6 result. But by default, in most distributions today, it's the other way around. You're going to return the IPv6 address first and then the IPv4 address. Interesting stuff. Good to know. Boom. Boom. The TLS connection. I want to just talk. I want to talk on this really briefly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, I, f I know that we've talked about, yeah, right? The joys of dual stack networking. Never really gets old. So I'm going to use a tool called Mixert. And if you haven't heard about Mixert, Mixert is awesome. It's a tool 
that you can use to generate certificates locally. Um, put out by Filippo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a certificate. I'm going to include, um, I'm just, let's just use this example. All right, so I've made a new certificate um, and I've configured it to use the following uh, subject alternative names. Cat example.com pen open SSL x509 text. You'll understand why I'm digging into this here in a second. But here are the subject alternative names for this certificate. Now, whenever we make a request, um, whenever we're interacting with a, with a, a TLS secured endpoint, we have to actually um, make sure that the host name or the IP address or however, whatever it is that we're putting after the, uh, the command or however we're identifying that host, that has to be encoded into the certificate. And this is super important because if we get it wrong, then what happens is that we're not going to be able to actually um, authenticate to the endpoint because there's no subject alternative name that matches the record that we're hitting. So for example, when I look at my kubectl uh, config view, inside of here, oh, flatten, minify, Instead of here, I'm using uh, 127001 as the host name to communicate with my API server, right? And I'm also using this other port. But that means that the serving certificate in front of my API server has to include that IP address. And this is actually why I'm getting into it because DNS, in my opinion, this is all related stuff, right? So if I docker exec into my A kind control plane here. Okay. So here's the serving certificate for the API server. we look at the subject alternative names, right? We can see that the IP address 127001 is in there. And so that's why we can communicate with it. I can actually change that name inside of my kubectl configuration to any of these records and it would work as long as I can reach it, right? Like obviously localhost or um, would, would work in this case because it's still referencing 127001. As long as I've got a a record somewhere that points localhost to 127001, we're good to go. I could also use this IP address. I could use this IP address. And if we think about it, um, this is kind of how other things are interacting with the Kubernetes service inside of Kubernetes as well, right? We ha we're allowing you to communicate with Kubernetes, the short name, right? You can also use a slightly longer name. You can use Kubernetes.default. You can also use kubernetes.default.service. And lastly, if you wanted to fully qualify it, you could use kubernetes.default.service.cluster.local. You could use any of these names to interact with the API server. And you could also use 109601 or 127001. The reason this is so important is because when you're actually establishing connectivity with that other thing, Typically speaking, inside of certs, this is where we can this is where we canonize what the valid host names for that thing are, right? Certificates force us to get it right. If we don't get the certificate right, then we won't be able to terminate connections on that other thing in a state in a, in, a, in a state of trust, right? That that connection will fail. We won't be able to communicate with it. So this is actually why I wanted to bring up the TLS connection. TLS con certificates almost always, serving certificates almost always encode in uh, either host names or IP addresses or both 
that you're going to use to communicate with that uh, secure endpoint. And so you have to get that right or it will be a rough time. All right, cool. This is all going a little slower than I thought it would, but you know, we're gonna get through it. Hope you all are finding this stuff interesting. I think it's, I think DNS is like one of my favorite subjects because it's always so much to cover. All right, so now that's just what is DNS. Let's get into some of the more fun stuff. Let's play with a little bit like how DNS is represented inside of Kubernetes. Exit, clear. So as we saw inside of our bash container, right? If we did a uh, cube kettle, get pods. Run. we jump in here we saw that we were resolving instead of our resolve.conf right we're resolving to this 1096.0.10 what is that that is a service get SVC kube DNS it's in the cube system namespace and it's called cube DNS and there's our cluster IP this is one of the interesting things about um, services is that you can define your own cluster IP. That's why it's always the same IP. Uh, it'll always be dot 10 of your service cider. And these are the services that it is exposing, right? It's exposing 53 for UDP, 53 for TCP, which are the ports for uh, both of those things. And then we also are exposing this other port, 9153 for TCP. And we'll talk about all three here in a second. Oh, sorry. Yes, you reminded me. What is NDOTS5? So I think this is the article I was reading about from the from the resolve.conf manual page. NDOTS5 sets a threshold for the number of dots which must appear in the name before an initial absolute query will be made. Woof. The default for n is one. Meaning that if there are any n dots in the, if there are any dots in the name, the name will be tried first as an absolute name before any search uh, list elements are appended to it. But why five? This is actually a really interesting article and I should probably link this one because I remember finding this one to be a really good write up on this particular subject. Let me just add this here. So because we can actually, because it, because in some cases, the fully qualified name for any service is going to have five different dots before um, the resolve, what end up, sorry, because it can have five different, um, because it can be like, exactly, service, namespace, service.cluster.local, exactly, that's right, you're right, Rory. But this is definitely still a good worth, a good thing worth digging into, and I think this is actually a thing that um, that was pointed out earlier, wherein like, can you actually include a last dot inside of your inside of your hosting lookup? Now, Maddie was pointing this out, 
right? Is it's talking about like how to speed up the resolution of these things. If I rely on Kubernetes, then that can actually, then that's going to incur a bunch of traffic. And if I'm like watching the wire for all of that traffic, we're going to see a lookup for Kubernetes. We're going to see a lookup for Kubernetes.service. We're going to see, or dot .default, Kubernetes.default.service, Kubernetes.default.service.cluster. We're going to see all of these individual records looked up before we actually, before we resolve it. <coughs> but, and that means that we can actually incur quite a lot of traffic. And so this is kind of where those things sort of come in. So if you wanted to understand a little bit more about that, it also points out some of the interesting things you can do for DNS config, where inside of this template, you can actually specify DNS config and modify things like dots or your search path or things like that for a particular, for a particular um, uh, pod or deployment. All right, that's what that is. Now back to our cluster. Our cluster, we have our service, and if we do a cute little describe of that service, we can see that we have two different entries, uh, 10.244.02 and 10.244.03. <clears throat> and they are part of a deployment. Get deploy dash n kube system. And by default, for quite a while now, most of the implementations of Kubernetes out there have been start have shifted to uh, core DNS. I think since about one sixteen or something like that. Um, and I remember putting a link into the change that made that particular move. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, I can't find it. All right. Well, there was a while ago when we actually moved um, uh, Core DNS to general availability. Uh, originally, we used a different thing called KubeDNS. And KubeDNS was not quite, it was great. And it got us pretty far. And then Core DNS was written by, um, written and donated to the CNCF. Core DNS is now like the kind of the default uh, DNS implementation inside of Kubernetes. And it's incredible. And there are like a, a, a few people that really, um, uh, focus on core DNS as an entity and they do an incredible job. Like I follow one of them on Twitter um, and it's always interesting learning about uh, DNS and how it works. So by default, this is a pretty standard deployment of Kubernetes, of, of DNS, right? Core DNS is made as a deployment. It's deployed onto whatever hosts you have available. Sometimes it's not deployed in a balanced way. Like in this case, I'm actually just running on a single node cluster. So it's deployed only on that one node. And even though I have two pods resolving things, that just means like kind of like I have two places where I can cache the result of a thing. The way DNS works inside of Kubernetes, uh, let's talk about like the configuration of it real quick. So if we go back to that deployment here, describe. This configuration has a few different things about it, um, which I want to talk through real quick. It's a pretty simple to, uh, configuration, but let's talk through it all. So we're exposing uh, ports 53 for UDP and TCP. So if your application looks up DC, uh, DNS names with, over TCP, it'll work. And also the more standard UDP for, uh, for accessing stuff. There are limits and requests configured, and there is a configuration file, the core, the core file. We're going to play with that here in a minute. Um, there's also a liveness and a readiness check configured for Core DNS. And so if Core DNS become, come, gets into a bad state, it'll fail. The configuration is actually hosted by a config map. And we're going to look at that config map just here in just a second as well. Um, and let's go ahead and look at that also. But the, before I move off of this particular output, there's one more thing I want to point out, which is easy to miss. In fact, so easy that I need to look at the deployment object. Edit. Okay. 
The thing I want to point out is this. So this line right here actually configures Accordion S to use the underlying hosts resolve.com. DNS policy is a way of configuring how the resolve.com will be presented to your pod. And this is actually kind of an interesting one. And it's interesting also because it's sort of a terrible name. Uh, it's not the default DNS policy, right? But if we do get all explain pod.spec.dns policy, we can see the different options. So the DNS policy are a few different, there are a few different options. This defaults to cluster first. This is one of the first things that drove me absolutely crazy about Kubernetes. Um, so it defaults to cluster first, and that means that we see a resolve.com just like we saw inside of our bash container where we use the resolver for 10.96.0.1. But we have a few other ways to configure that resolve.com inside of Kubernetes, right? We can configure it with um, default, and when we configure it with default, we present to the pod the same resolve.conf that the underlying host sees. Wherever the kubelet's running, whatever kubelet sees as that resolve.conf, that's what we're going to get for what's what we're going to get inside the pod. And the reason that's important is because this is actually by default inside of Core DNS, this is the way that Core DNS sets its upstream resolvers, right? So because we actually have the, the DNS policy for the core, core DNS deployment using the default configuration, that means that the core DNS is automatically configured to leverage the, uh, the DNS resolvers inside of the underlying host to interact with uh, its upstreams. It's about almost 227. Good to see you, Steve. Thank you for checking in with us. All right. The other options you have are this one, which is a really super interesting one, cluster first with hostnet, and you also have none. If you want to specify your own resolve.conf, like with the DNS options, you can specify none, and you can actually uh, be very specific about the way that it's configured. DNS uh, uh, cluster first with hostnet is also a really interesting one because it allows you to configure, yes, it allows you to configure the, um, the pod to use the resolvers of the underlying host when you're using, actually, sorry, it allows you to use the resolvers that are expressed by, uh, by the cluster first result, but you're using hostnet. So let's talk about that here just for a second. Question from Bogda is, is DNS policy managed by the kubelet? So I guess it depends on what you mean by uh, is it is DNS policy managed by the kubelet? Kubelet is responsible for configuring or for determining what to put inside of your resolve.conf. Kubelet is responsible for that, right? So when you start up a container, the thing that's actually populating your resolve.conf, it's going to be kubelet. And it's either going to use, and it's either going to build that based on what it knows about your container in the cluster first case, or it's going to build that based on the option that you specify in DNS policy uh, but it's always going to be your kubelet that configures it for that particular container. All right, Does that makes sense. I hope that made. I hope that answered your question. So, cube kettle create pod. Cool. All I'm just going to grab a container here real quick because I want to play with this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to play with this one. And 
to do that. Not so good. What's happening there? because of the newer configuration stuff. So what I'm doing here, I accidentally set the image name to the wrong thing. Mm. Boop. All right. All right, so get pods. Now we have a couple of different pods running. We do kubectl exec ti default bash cat etsy resolve.conf. That's our default. Now, if we, because we have set the DNS policy to default, we see a very similar uh, uh, configuration as the underlying kubelet does, right? So the underlying kubelet sees this configuration, right? And we can see that because if we do kubectl, exec, actually we do docker exec ti kind control plane cat se resolve.conf these things are the same, right? So when we set our DNS policy to default, we're configuring that resolve.conf to be just like it is the way that the kubelet sees it. Okay. Now that means that we're just basically taking the DNS servers that the kubelet sees and we're presenting them to the pod directly. And there's one other interesting option, which is that other pod. Let's just jump in here and take a look at that real quick.
Now this one's super interesting because it looks just like uh, default, or it looks just like cluster first, right? I mean, there's no real difference. We still see option end dots. The name server is 1096.0.10. We see the search path all configured. So what's different about this than the other thing, right? The difference is this. I'm seeing all the IP addresses from the underlying host. That means that I'm actually using host network, right? So I have a daemon that perhaps needs to run on the underlying host in the host network. Maybe it's doing Wireshark or something else and I needed to actually have it exposed to the underlying host. This gives me a way of exposing that underlying host network and still allowing it to resolve services that are running inside the cluster, right? So if I were to do apk add bind tools and I did host kube echo, for example, I'd still be able to resolve it even though I'm under the underlying host. Now what's interesting about this is if I do the same thing from inside of the control plane, Post, ah, figures, update. Okay. Host, yes. Host, echo, I don't resolve it. Right? Because remember that my resolve.conf on the underlying host is not 10.96.0.1. Host echo 10 dot default dot svc dot cluster dot local. I still won't be able to resolve it, but if I point that resolver at 10.96.0.10, I can resolve it. Right now, this is the chicken and egg problem. This is the last thing I'm going to cover in this session. I'm probably going to continue this session another time, but there's still tons more to cover about DNS, but I'm not going to be able to get to all of it. Um, but you know how it is. We do, we do these things in multiple sessions, but look at how much we have left. We didn't even do like node local yet. There's so, so much more to talk about. So the one thing I want to point out here, uh, before we move out is a, is a chicken and egg problem, right? Um, and that is that if you have services that are running in hostnet, or you had some daemon running on the underlying host that needed access, uh, maybe you're like using a daemon set and you wanted to make use of that daemon set to interact both with the outside world and with um, services that are exposed inside your cluster, there needs to be a configuration that allows you to do that because by default, your host uh, can't can't use uh, core DNS as its resolver. It can't use the Kubernetes DNS resolver as its resolver. Because if you think about it, there's a chicken and egg problem here, right? I need to be able to resolve those host names for things that I care about, like docker.io or to pull images and those sorts of things. I need to be able to interact with those things long before I get to the place where I have kubedns deployed. And this is that chicken and egg problem your host's DNS resolution needs to be working before you have Kubernetes deployed. And so for you to actually interact with uh, or to be able to resolve host names, you kind of need to already, ha you, you, you need to be able to, um, to make that work before you have kubedns. And then if you wanted to expose a way for those system processes to run on your host that would allow you to resolve those things, then you can actually use something like cluster first with hostnet, which relies on kubedns being up but you have to be careful with it. You have to make sure that uh, your, your, your assumptions are valid. So I couldn't use cluster first with hostnet um, inside of a static pod, for example, it wouldn't work. But anyway, that's that point. I think maybe the point that I'll exit on, it's already 2.39, is the metrics one. So we've talked about the way D DNS resolution works inside of pods. We've talked about the fact that it is a deployment. We've talked about how DNS, um, we talked about this DNS policy inside the pod spec. I should move that up. Um, we haven't talked too much about these things yet. Uh, we talked a little bit about default upstreams, but let's talk about those things, right? 
And so, and then I'll have to get going. So there is a config map, kubectl describe config map dash n kube system core DNS. I'm not going to get into a crazy amount of detail here because I don't have that much time. But inside of this configuration map, we have the Kubernetes plugin turned on. <coughs> we have uh, we, res oh, nice. we have reverse lookup enabled. We have Prometheus metrics exposed on port 9153. <coughs> and we have this line right here, which is I think one of the more important ones that tells us to forward any request to our Etsy resolve.com. And we just figured out just now what we were talking about was how we populate that Etsy resolve.com, right? We're populating that Etsy resolve.com by, by using DNS policy default. And that means that if we don't have a cached response, then we're going to send that response. We're going to send that query up to the configured, the configuration of resolve.com. And then here's that piece earlier. Remember we talked about the fact that DNS resolution inside of core DNS is always set a hard set at 30 seconds. That's this line right here. It's telling it to cache the result for 30 seconds, no matter what. doesn't matter how long the TTL is for the upstream record. Core DNS will only, will only hold a valid record for any record for 30 seconds. And there's much more of this configuration file to explore, but we're not going to explore it this time. We're going to explore it next time. Let's see. The last thing I wanted to show you was the metrics. So kind of cool stuff. Let's do kubectl describe SV, uh, kubectl get. SVC dash n kube system cube DNS dash OEML. So the name of the port is metrics. And this is going to be important here in a second. There's a couple of different ways we can get to this metrics point and get value from it, right? One way we could do it would we could we could do cube kettle forward uh, port forward dash n kube system svc nine one five three nine one five three Right now, uh, so now what we've just done is we've just like started port forwarding to that metrics endpoint on port 9153. I'm going to pop up on a new tab here. And we can do curl 127001 9153 slash metrics. And we can see the metrics that come back um, from the particular DNS, from the particular DNS server that we're interacting with, right? And this is a pretty interesting result. And so if you're like actually trying to understand how core DNS is handling the load inside of your Kubernetes cluster, these are super valuable metrics to catch because you can do things like determine whether core DNS cache, cache hits are denial or success, like how many successes we get for each request and how many were denied for the cache, how many cache misses, um, what the cache size is, the DNS request duration for seconds, it's a histogram, so we can determine like over time, are we seeing uh, DNS queries, are, we can see DNS, um, DNS requests go up or down for the UDP protocol or for the TCP protocol. Getting information about different zones, the global zone, there's also a zone for
Okay, so here's your forward request duration. How long is it taking that upstream DNS server to resolve? So how long is it like, and we can see that right now we're seeing more records in kind of the shorter time frame or a little. So we're seeing some good, we're seeing some good results there. We can see what plugins are enabled. We can see the GC duration, GC stuff because it's a Go binary. So we can see all of the, the Go housekeeping stuff that's necessary to understand. But the things that are interesting in, in uh, monitoring uh, Core DNS are things like how long is the upstream resolution taking? And um, things like how many NX records or NX domains we're seeing. And also the, um, the ones here up at the top, like cache hits and misses, right? Tell us like, are we actually getting some value out of the cache or not? Will it be possible to enter well, to list the entity entries discovered by CoreDNS? Hmm. I think I need just a few more words to understand what you mean, Mahan. Are you saying are you do you, are you saying that you want to see what's in the cache? Or are you saying you want to understand what's held as a record that um, that core DNS holds, which I guess is the same thing. Is that where you're going? Okay. So um, I don't believe that is exposed. And if you think about it, we couldn't expose that as a metric. Uh, I'm not aware of like a way of determining what's inside of core DNS's cache. We can, we can, we have some other information about the cache. Like we can see what size and how many, and, um, and that sort of stuff. But I don't, but I don't think we can actually dump what's inside the cache per se. It's all in memory. One of the things that's uh, interesting to know though, is, um, is your point about how those records are, are, are held. Right. And so, um, I guess this is, this will be my really, really last point before we, before we bounce out of here for the day. Is that PI? So when I do that, host uh, test.metal.cage.work, that's a cached record. And if I do dig on that, we can see how long it's cached, right? It's cached for 30 seconds, and it'll be cached for 30 seconds on both of my DNS servers. If I do host echo, and I do dig on that same, Um, again, 30 seconds, right? Configured inside of the inside of the zone for the cluster. And this is the Kubernetes plugin. And so what's actually happening here is that this record isn't 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 ever placed inside of a flat file anywhere. This record represents a cached result of a programmatic response of a programmed uh, of a of a response coming from Core DNS as a daemon. This is like an application result, not something where um, uh, recorded by a flat file. I don't ever have to write down all of the services inside of my entire cluster and what IP addresses they're associated with. Instead, the Kubernetes plugin takes that call. It says, oh, you're looking for default.service.cluster.local. It then evaluates the services that it has cached, right? And it says, oh, there's a new service that's been defined. It's called echo.default.service.cluster.local. Echo and here's the cluster IP associated with that service and it caches that for 30 seconds and it sees if it, if it continues to exist. If it stopped existing, then the Kubernetes plugin would stop reporting on it. If a new one gets created, the Kubernetes plugin would be able to respond for those for that new thing. I haven't actually explored that. The Core DNS cache prefetch feature which is an interesting point, right? Like it basically gives you the ability to populate what's inside cache a little, uh, a little more aggressively. And I haven't explored it too much and I haven't really seen too many people else. I haven't seen too many others exploring it too much. Um, again, it's 30 seconds, right? So like you would have to think about the tuning a little bit more, I think, to really get some real value out of that one. But it is an interesting point. All right, my friends, it's 2.50. I'm gonna call it a day here and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Um, I really enjoyed digging into DNS with y'all. It's always a fun, always a fun thing. 
I'm going to be, um, I'm probably going to do another episode on DNS because there's a ton more that I wanted to cover. And I know DNS is kind of a strong topic. I was just kind of surprised by how long it took for me to get through the content that I had already. Um, but we'll come back and beat up on it some more. Some of the other things I wanted to cover were things like configuring core DNS specifically, right? Like you can actually specify the upstreams and some of the examples about why you would do that. And there's even a way to configure what's called stub DNS or maybe even split horizon DNS inside of core DNS. And we'll talk about what that is next time we talk. Um, that is, in my opinion, a super killer feature, especially if you're if your Kubernetes clusters are attached to an existing fabric, like where services exist already, it really gives us a lot of really great capability. Um, we did talk about the chicken and egg problem. We haven't talked about service discovery things. We're going to. We talked a little bit about it because we talked about like the form of the service name, right? Um, we talked about like, you know, echo.svc.cluster.local. And we talked about why that is called that. And that's service discovery. We're going to talk about service type cluster, uh, service type external name, which is a DNS trick. And we're also probably going to talk about service type none, which is also referred to as a headless service, which is also kind of a DNS trick. And so we're going to talk about both of those services next time we get together. And we're also going to explore node local DNS, which is really cool because it means then you have a caching name server on the node that caches all of the responses for all of the pods that are local to your node. Super cool stuff. And I can't wait to dig into it with you next time. But that is my week. I hope you all have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a bunch. Be excellent to each other. No matter what, that's all we got. <laughs>